Hello and welcome to a special presentation from the Aspen Opera Theater Center and Vocal Arts at the Aspen Music Festival and School. We're delighted to have with us today uh, our co-artistic director of Aspen Opera Theater, Renee Fleming, who is a co-artistic director with Patrick Summers of the Houston Grand Opera, and Julia Bullock and Ryan McKinney. I'm not going to do a lot of introduction of these brilliant artists because I think they're very well known. But I thought I would say about Julia that uh, she was a student at the Eastman School, the Bard College Conservatory and the Juilliard School, uh, also at the St. Louis uh, Opera Theater, uh, winner of the Sphinx Medal of Excellence, winner of Lincoln Center's Martin Siegel Award, uh, winner of the Naumburg uh, First Prize, a, a prize previously won by Don Upshaw. And uh, significantly, uh, Julia, is artist in residence at the San Francisco Symphony working with Esabeka Salomon. Um, I, I think she is uh, one of the most important young artists in the whole world of music uh, by virtue of her commitment uh, to a tremendous breadth and depth of engagement with all forms of music and with social action. So I hope you will enjoy meeting her in this way today. Ryan McKinney uh, is a treasured member of our Aspen faculty. He was a student at the Aspen Opera Theater Center, a member of the Houston Grand Opera Studio. Uh, brilliant, brilliant career, including many uh, significant roles at the Metropolitan Opera. His Amfortis at Bayreuth, just a byword for our time. And so we're thrilled to have Ryan with us as well. And then Renee Fleming, uh, words fail me when I begin to think about Renee. And I think I will just turn the podium over to Renee to begin the class. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I'm so excited to be with you all today because I get to talk to two incredible artists and people that I admire, people whose work I have absolutely followed and enjoyed immensely and will continue to follow. So the, both Ryan and Julie have become leaders in their fields for the creativity and entrepreneurial and out of the box thinking they've shown uh, with their careers, with really doing things that hadn't been done before. Uh, and this is what will, I think, hopefully inspire all of you to be thinking along the same lines. So Ryan and Julia, first tell us what you have gained during the pandemic and what you have lost by being at home. Wow. Ryan, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you, Renee, for inviting us. Thank you, Alan. Um, this is really exciting. I just to say, like, was in awe of the amazing uh, recital that Renee gave on Saturday uh, for the Met. Um, I, you know, <clears throat> we've all lost a lot. Uh, obviously, like many performances, um, basically entire years worth of performance schedule um, for me has been canceled. Um, that's obviously really sad. Everybody's, you know, um, wishing that were not the case. <laughs> but it has also been a really interesting time for me to kind of explore um, how to communicate in this art form in other ways, uh, primarily through video things and more what I might call film now. Um, so in the beginning of, you know, back in March, um, we decided to start making these videos and, and collaborate with other singers. And, and my interest has always been um, not just like a living room recital type of thing, but also like storytelling. So a lot of these videos have been fun and some of them have been serious, but all sort of trying to um, tell a story, at, at least emotionally, which I think is what opera is really good at. Um, and in these, um, through that process, I also started working with my, my brother and my stepmother have a small film production company in North Carolina here where we live now. Um, and so we've, I started, they let us borrow some equipment. We started making some sort of higher um, production value um, versions of the same thing. So we just, some of you might've seen a, a piece that we put out last week called Glimmer Glass Leader for the Glimmer Glass Festival which we shot on location and um, I was really fun to make um, and we're making a bunch more um, 
things for different companies and with different mm-hmm. artists. And that's been really gratifying to see that there's still a way forward and, and to see what the range of this art form really is. Cause I think we often um, sort of think of it in this tiny box, but it can be, it can be so much bigger than that. So that's been a, a pretty interesting and eye opening experience. Well, thank you, Ryan. We're going to delve more into that a little bit later, too, because it's so extraordinary what you're doing. And Julia, how about for you? What I've, I'll start with what I've gained, uh, just some time at home and um, I guess regrouping a bit and gaining some perspective on um, the, I mean, I, I, I think I always have to, I continually have to frame and reframe why I'm involved in the arts. Um, and I go through this cycle of needing to do that almost every six months. It's not so much in doubt of why I'm singing, uh, although that was certainly a part of my journey earlier on. But now it's I'm thinking um, about all of the opportunities that I've been given up until this point and how they have um, gleaned more and more opportunities. But then at this moment, um, what space can I now start making for other artists? Um, and uh, the pressure, or I guess the insistence that I once felt about needing to provide my voice, for even just in a proposal of any project, it's like, does it have to be my voice now that sings it? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Actually, there's room for, and I'm wanting really to hear from so many more people. Um, so that's. That is certainly one thing that I've gained and I guess lost, but gained. <laughs> um, and uh, yes, this precious time at home. I mean, we're so often on the road and um, I hate to say rushing from thing to, th- to event to event and performance to performance. Um, and these intense connections that we make with people while we're on the job are very real, um, but to settle down and also consider the amount of resources that have been used in order to, again, just give, give me all these great opportunities. It's like, how, how can those resources now be refunneled and channeled? Um, so yeah, that's, that's, I guess what I've been thinking about more recently. You know, I'm with you on the uh, being home and, and, and also kind of uh, establishing your partnerships, you know, and the people that you live with and care about and love and really kind of revisiting that. Cause that's something our lifestyle doesn't typically afford. Um, we're traveling so much and on the road. So I'm going to show a couple of excerpts over and also some examples of what you've been producing while at home. And we're going to start with Julia's version of Carol King's Up on the Roof, one of the songs you've shared during this pandemic. Um, let's hear that. Oh 
Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> so beautiful and so true. It's very inspirational. So um, when we last spoke, which was at Carnegie Hall in January, it seems like a century ago, uh, you were in the throes. You'd done Zauberland with uh, Katie Mitchell, which is a piece that highlights the refugee crisis um, and many of them really, frankly, around the world. And Pearl Noir, I think you were with the, the look at Josephine Baker that is having a, a continued life. It's, it's a project that you're able to uh, continue to revisit. Um, clearly, you're not waiting for offers to come in for Deflator Mouse. So how, how do you choose and find and create opportunities for yourself in terms of material? Sure. Well, a lot of it comes from, I guess, honestly, I'm like just a, the people that I want to work with. I, I know that that is a unique position to be in um, and a privileged position to be in. But um, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to um, waste my time. I hate to, <laughs> I hate to put it that way, but uh, I, I just want to make sure that the art that I'm making is something that I, I myself want to return to multiple times. Um, it's not, just the work that that uh, other people have deemed to or named as something to consider, you know, that's been considered very important. But it's um, these are stories that I feel are really important to be told. Um, and whether I mean most most of the art that we make, um, at least the the themes that we're exploring, um, are very similar in a lot of the pieces that we share and. Uh, yeah, I think there, though the certain lens, sometimes the lenses through which they are shared are not always um, the easiest for all for everyone to relate to. And uh, find, finding a way to tap into those universal truths um, on multiple levels is really has been really important for me. Is this something that you uh, you know have collaborators that you say I really want to try this project? Um, and why don't we explore this or, or how do these things actually come about? Yes. I mean, <clears throat> so my introduction to Peter Sellers, um, well, really it started through watching a DVD of his when I was in high school. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, years later, uh, while I was at Bard, um, call it at, at Bard, uh, with Don Upshaw, um, she brought a few of us to the Ojai Festival in California and Peter was there directing her in another piece. I, he heard me sing that night and, uh, we had a really intimate, beautiful exchange. Um, and then a few months later I sang an audition for him, um, at the Juilliard school and, uh, he was actually looking for a baritone for another project. But then after hearing me said, oh my gosh, I've been waiting for 25 years to do the Indian Queen by Purcell. Um, do you know any Purcell? No, I don't. Uh, could you learn some in the next week? Could you go to Madrid and we can see if we can figure this out and it's the right thing? Um, wow. so a lot of it was just preparation, you know, ha right place, right time and being prepared. I know a lot of uh, artists talk about this. Um, That's wonderful. So all these young artists listening <laughs> come to the Aspen Music Festival next summer and make that relationship, whether it's a conductor or a composer or um, somebody who comes in and does some special piece. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, it's well, happened and, very quickly. And they can be, um, it, the, the beauty of it is that these, these are lifelong relationships, lifelong creative relationships right. Um, right. that I think all of us are making. I mean, Ryan and I also, this is where we first our first project was also with a P, was Peter Sellers, correct? Or no, no, it was Schubert uh, <laughs> in L.A. Phil, wasn't it? It was. Well, it was Yuval Sharon, but then we're we're more connected through Peter than anything else. I think. So. Well, um, Yuval is a wonderful artist to connect with as well. Um, certainly, Peter Sellers. So, Ryan, we we I got to perform in Streetcar Named Desire with you, and it was clear to me then that you are a brilliant singing actor. And I saw you and Giovanni recently. It was so believable to see your character's drug infused decline. Um, you know, and that was a, quite a production because Matthew Rose also hurt his leg in the middle of a performance and came back in on a wheelchair and you all had to completely make up the staging in the moment, which from, by all reports, I wasn't there, but I heard it was actually really fun and probably the most exciting performance of all. So tell us about your process in creating a role because you are really one of those special actors in opera. Thanks, Renee. Um, <laughs> the, the Giovanni was 
crazy for that reason, but also because I stepped in very last minute. So I had like five days of rehearsal before we even got to that. And then the staging that we had, we had to toss out because um, Matthew hurt his leg and there was, we, it was actually quite fun. Um, not for him with his leg, but everyone else had a good time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, uh, Julia's talking about like projects she does that, you know, feel like you want to go back to and that are, to me, it's sort of about authenticity that, and, and in the projects that I want to do, it's like that, that I need, I want to, I want to be authentic to who I am as a person. And I think it's similar with the character. Like I try to, I try to approach them as a human being and not as a, a stock kind of caricature. I think something like Stanley is a really good example of like, it's very easy to just lean into how horrible he is and kind of judge him as an actor. What the funny thing that I find is that the more humanity you put into, especially bad characters, the more you give them real reasons for what they do and real um, emotions, oftentimes the worse they come off, the more you hate them because <laughs> they're three dimensional. Um, and I, I think that's great. Like Stanley's a character who he's so reprehensible in so many ways. Um, but the audience has to feel like he's real for the thing to work. Um, right. And so, yeah, for me, it's always finding, really letting myself be uncomfortable with this person's motivation and try to find it and not just say, oh, well, he's evil. He's just bad, um, which I right. think is sort of- Because that can be two dimensional if, exactly. if you're playing it that, for that alone. So yeah. are you, do you write things out in advance of a production while you're working in a production? Because it is a layering process, isn't it? Finding all those details. Yeah, I do. Um, I do write some things out. Uh, I tend to just jot down ideas, but I often find myself kind of finding my, my way in from one phrase or one physical thing, just some little thing that then informs all the rest of it. Um, you know, like with Stanley, it was like a posture thing, this like jutted out chin kind of in people's face, or sometimes there's like, you know, I don't know, Giovanni with the, in that production with the cocaine, like, okay, if we're going to have, if he's going to do cocaine at one moment, like what are all the other things that a person does who is addicted to cocaine and how do we like find how that thread moves through the whole thing? So often I'm looking for that one kind of in or a few little ins that, that help me kind of get into the whole thing. So under the head of uh, if we knew then what we know now, what would you tell young artists about auditioning? How far can they go to bring that character to life in an audition setting? To me, the biggest thing, again, is being authentic to yourself. I think there's sometimes that you can overthink what people want to see. And if you are giving something that is honest um, and it's, it can be completely still and simple and almost no movement. If it's honest and emotionally truthful, it can have a huge impact. It can also be that you can stand there and be scared and there can be no movement to it and it feels stuck. The, on the other side, you can give this huge physical performance where you're chewing the scenery, but it feels like you are um, thinking in your head, oh, everyone's gonna think I'm a great actor. Um, and you, there's a way to do that that is authentic to the character and to the music that I think that's really the, the, the thing to search for, not necessarily like how much physicality is the right amount or um, how should I move my face or where should my eyes go and those type of things. Like sometimes those can be helpful to find your way in. But right. um, for the most part, I think the honest emotional storytelling is the thing that that impacts people when they're when they're listening to you, especially for the first time. So I'm going to go right to your. You do. You were going to. Uh, you're going to comment on that, Julia. I was just going to say, and it also impacts the singing the greatest way. Absolutely. That's excellent. No, you're absolutely true. Um, it, the honesty is is everything, and then but within that, you both have the ability to to find details that take you beyond, as you said, the stock, beyond the expected and into your own artistic territory. And that's what we're all aiming for, is to become artists. Um, so let's talk about your digital work during the pandemic. I, I'm so delighted, Ryan, when I saw this clip of you and Jamie Barton, it's Corona Demerum. You've probably all seen it, but let's show a short excerpt. Vulcan 
Gemahl, erwache! Der Wanner seligen Saal bewachen mir Tür und Tor. Mannes Ehre, ewige Macht, ragen zu endlosem Ruhm. Auf, was der Träumer wohl in dem Trug, erwache, Mann und der Wege. You all, if you haven't seen it, you have to watch the whole thing. It is so incredibly delightful. So how did you do this? Because the direction is amazing. The set direction is amazing between the beer and the pizza <laughs> and the Tums. We get to Tums. I love it. Yeah. So talk, tell us about this process. I think what's interesting about this particular project is that it it we reimagined kind of like how you could do something like this. And it's been that way since. I think we often think you have to have this idea sort of ahead of time of like, what do I really want to do here? And again, this came from, I just wanted to work with Jamie. And so we I was like, what should we do together? And we said, well, why don't we do that Rheingold scene? And we had Kathy Kelly play us a piano track. I sent it to Jamie. And not, we didn't talk about any of it. She was like, should it be like sort of maybe like a Zoom call or something? I was like, yeah, sure. Just do whatever you want and I'll make something out of it. And so she sent me back this incredible video, which of course, like the best moment of the whole thing is her brushing her teeth and spitting toothpaste while she's singing. <laughs> and, and I saw that and I was like, oh, well, we have to just make this as ridiculous as possible. Um, so, so then I shot all the rest of it after her part um, and edited together a bunch of it. Um, and you know just had fun with it like how you know how many and it what's also interesting is that it's actually pretty faithful to the libretto <laughs> like there's a lot i know it seems silly but like there's a lot in there that really works um for the actual opera um but i think all these things is like you know the giving yourself especially for you young singers that are like thinking about making digital content you know giving yourself the freedom to just do something way different than you thought and, and also the freedom to fail. Like when we put that together, I was like, is this the stupidest thing I've ever made in my life? Is anyone gonna think this is good? Cause it's, you know, I'm like eating pizza and drinking vodka out of a coffee cup in a bathrobe on, you know, on the internet. And like- <laughs> and you, you also sound absolutely beautiful oh, thanks. <laughs> on this track. So tell us, give us the nuts and the bolts. What apps, what programs are you using yeah, to do this? this? And who this filmed one. it? Who yeah. was holding the camera? That, um, well, most of the time it was just set up on like a, had like, it was a cell phone and it was just on a, like a cell phone tripod. Um, and, you know, you see that first shot that sort of pans to me. Right. That's actually just one shot that I did a digital pan later in the editing. So the camera's not really moving. Um, and we did that for a lot of it. Like, and so I did, I had a demo version of Final Cut Pro, which is an editing software that's, that I still use now for a bunch of things. Um, and, and it's all cell phones. It's not, there's nothing fancy about it. It's just some clever editing. Um, she, her, I made it look like she's looking at her phone when I'm like, we're looking at each other's phones while we're, you know, like a, if it was a Skype call. But in actuality, like the video she sent me is just a regular video and we, I masked it in to make it look that way. Um, so wow. a lot of that was just editing magic, um, but nothing too extremely crazy, really. It was just sort of being creative about the ideas. But I thought the call coming into you that was from Frau was, was pretty <laughs> fabulous. Yeah, we had actually, it was oh, just perfect. Tanya. I, I changed Tanya's name, my wife Tanya, on her cell phone 
so that when it popped up on mine, it would say Frau. So she called me <laughs> during the middle of the shot, which why? then later she was it. like, why does it still say this? And I had to fix it all. But <laughs> So um, I'm going to come back to you uh, for another excerpt. But Julia, in, in Brown Baby, you seem to be channeling Nina Simone. And you've cited also Billie Holiday as an inspiration. And I love your performance of John Musso's uh, Litany that we're going to see a little bit later. So um, let's, let's uh, first of all, are there projects planned for, uh, I mean, really the Nina Simone thing, I just went, wow, this is remarkable, the sound. Oh, well, thank, thank you. I, um, well, Nina Simone has been a great inspiration to me, really, was guess since I was 15, and right when I was also starting to get really interested in classical music. So it was so cool as I was getting introduced to Bach and then connecting that with Nina Simone's improvisations on the piano. It was like, whoa, okay. This is, she did not abandon any part of her musical interests in order to play music. And it, it, um, you know, later in, into, I guess, yeah, it was during my master's work. Um, I thought, you know, why am I limiting my own musical interests and this this idea of being a, a classical singer, like what does that really mean? Oh, it's just that you're singing again classics. <laughs> you're singing classics, right. and that is that has nothing to do with genre. Um, when, so, I, I, I so pod- admire yeah. that in you, mm-hmm. and you still mm-hmm. you can't and you don't compromise your classical singing either to do it, which is important. We still have to remember our day jobs, right? Well, it's the found. I mean, it's really the foundation of the this bel canto technique that's the foundation of everything and and if you can find because what all that that's you're seeking is this liberation in sound and liberation in your body so that whatever it is that you're imagining whatever sounds that you are wanting to make and how you're wanting to express yourself it's possible without damage um and it has it has been very good for me actually during this time to film and have to watch myself very closely it's like the amount of things that i'm learning i know all of you, if you're not watching Renee Fleming and how she sings, um, you turn on, you can turn off the sound and you can learn so much just watching Renee sing because it's all through this speaking kind of mouth. And you know, I'm I am learning so much during just these past few months uh, about my own singing and what now it's unlocking. Um, and some of it certainly is through teaching, but it's 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 also just through watching myself and having again a little more time to experiment. Well, we're um, time is going quickly, so I'm actually going to ask you all. Uh, we'll 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 suggest that you check out some other of these tracks uh, on your own time because I want to make sure that we talk to you both. So you've both chosen to record song literature in recent months, and uh, what can we all do for song? And I think one of the keys lies in what you just said: classics um, and giving that a broader definition and using some of the styles that we learn. Many of us. In, in our enjoyment of other types of music. So talk about that. I mean, um, and Brian, we're, I want to show a little, I definitely want to show you Fonella, which is short. In einem Bächlein helle, da schoß in frohe Eil die launische Forelle vorüber wie ein Pfeil. Ich stand an dem Gestande und sah in süßer Ruh des muntern Fischleins Bade im kleinen Bächlein zu. Des muntern Fischleins Bade im kleinen Bächlein zu. Ein Fischer mit der Rute wohl an dem Ufer stand und saß mit kaltem Blute, wie sich das Fischlein wand. So lang dem Wasser helle, so dacht ich nicht gebricht, so fängt er die Forelle mit seiner Angel nicht. So fängt er die Forelle mit seiner Angel nicht. Endlich fahrt dem Diebe die Zeit zu lang, 
Er macht das Bächlein tückisch trübe. Und eh ich es gedacht, so zuckte seine Rute. Das Fischlein, das Fischlein zappelt dran. Und ich mit regem Blute sah die Betrogene an. Und ich mit regem Blute sah die Betrogene an. So talk, tell us about your thoughts about um, the art of song. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, song feels like to me kind of the most basic version of what we do as singers, not just in classical music, but in any form. And it's kind of the building block around which everything else um, is, is made. So I think right now song is obviously having a, a kind of opportunity for resurgence. Um, you know, it's, generally just a singer and a pianist, which when you have that combination, there are a lot more possibilities in terms of what you can do during a pandemic, obviously. But to me, it's all about storytelling, you know, whether that's literal storytelling, like in Di Forella, like, you know, there's a, a fisherman right there who's like trying to catch a fish and, and, and the whole thing, or emotional storytelling, like something like Vinterizza, that's all about this kind of swelling of, of sadness. Um, and, you know, I think in, to Julia's point too, and all the work that she's been doing that expanding, I, there's a moment to expand our idea of what art song is. Um, I think that that's been going on for a while now um, where people are adding different genres into recitals and things. And I, I hope that continues because really, you know, when you look at what's traditional, there's a lot of artificial um, boundaries there that I think are totally unnecessary. And of course that, um, also includes uh, sexism and racism in terms of our programming. And so it's really an exciting time to expand kind of what we think of as the, the songs that make up a classical music recital. So you're actually, you, you've become a film producer in, in terms of presenting yeah, this bit. repertoire. <laughs> and you're, you're gifted. I mean, even your lighting and your background right now in your digital shot is quite beautiful yeah. and effective right? Everybody clock that, how good <laughs> it looks, even having the guitar in the background. Um, yeah, I've given so many of these uh, webinar interviews now and people put, they place their books. You could put your, you know, anything, anything that you want that says who you are in the background. It's really smart. Um, Julia, what, what are your th thoughts about the, the art of the recital? Art of the recital. Well, it's a chance to um, explore a chance to explore how and do we perpetuate it though because it uh, there are so few engagements are there ways? oh that is that is the truth isn't it um honest uh, oh renee I, I don't know if i have an answer for this for that kind of question but i in in this time it's you know i we were all so dependent upon uh presenters we were so dependent upon a few um, institutions to provide people with platforms. And now that is not the, really the truth so much anymore. Uh, as yeah. Ryan has now made very clear, um, you can turn a brook outside of your house or in your glimmer class <laughs> into your stage set. Um, you can turn your living room into a recital hall. Um, those may not be always the most satisfying you know, fulfilling environments, but what it does do, it encourages you to like fully engage your imagination fully uh, and, and also just deal with the medium that, you know, is now in front of us. Like we are, and really that medium, the craft, the craft of this, the art of this is in the communication. Um, it's not just in creating a beautiful sound. We want a very clear sound. Uh, that's super important when we're talking about uh, audio and recording um, and visuals. Yes, we're looking for clarity, but also that has to do with clarity of delivery of a message. Um, yeah, I, 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 I agree. Any of that. Yeah, but. But the, but the good news is that because we've established these digital platforms and, and made them even strengthen them in a way, there is an opportunity for anybody who's creative to start thinking about how to make this work for people. Um, Ryan, how many views has uh, Corona Demerung gotten? Uh, I think it's like 20,000 or something, which is, you know, in the realm of 
classical music is pretty good in the real world. It's like not anything. But I think one of the interesting things about our art form is like, it's not ever been about being more popular than everything else. So it, I think right. that's good to remember right now that it's easy well, to just sort of chase after clicks, but. But um, it's a much bigger audience than we get in a hall. It's true. So yeah, that's, that's one way true. of looking at it. Um, so Julia, we were in touch recently when you were at the center of an unfortunate uh, Facebook correspondence on your personal Facebook thread. And you have two, which I find really smart and interesting, connected to the Tucker Foundation. Um, I thought you handled it brilliantly. You were always gracious. Uh, and, 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 and out of it came some very positive results. Can you share a little bit with uh, all of these young artists here about your experience and, and how what you went through when you were dealing with this? Sure. Um, well, I, I, I posted an article about, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very weird being here in, in Germany right now uh, and watching the United States from afar. And of course, I'm, I'm watching the news very carefully um, and distressed by a lot of what I am seeing, particularly in regards to police brutality and um, what has been ongoing in the Black Lives Matter movement since 2013. Um, and so I posted an article uh, uh, about um, the, well, the, our government and uh, one of the board members from the Richard Tucker Foundation, which is really one of the most important uh, foundations in opera um, and represents a lot, a, a lot represents, represents many, many things to a lot of people um, when we talk about our standards of excellence when it comes to opera, um, uh, came onto uh, my personal page uh, on Facebook and and posted a comment essentially saying really just violent racist things um, and untrue things. Uh, and when I asked him to um, check his uh, resources, <laughs> um, uh, he continued to engage. And interestingly, I mean, Ryan McKinney um, caught this right as it was happening, uh, as did Theo Hoffman. And um, there were several artists then over the course of a few hours who started engaging with him. And then it ended up unfolding into a conversation about um, the, the racism and really underlying uh, white supremacy and even just white dominant culture, how that it seems to affect a lot of institutions in classical music. Um, I did not have a specific call or I did not, I did not say, well, this should get, I, I want this particular board member fired. And um, I, I was not, I didn't put up any demands, but I just thought it was so interesting and very beautiful seeing how engaged the entire arts community, our arts community um, got um, ignited and yeah. um, invested. Uh, and honestly, just uh, the, the responses were not just about heat and pr pressure. It was, it was actually calling for reflection, I think. Um, and yes, moving, f I, I, I don't know how much more I, I really need to talk about this. I've still um, kept all of this up because it's an ongoing discussion for every institution um, in, across the world. Where do you think we are, both of you, and where do you think we need to be? If I could just jump in, in for a second in the, you know, in that, this I think goes with your question, Renee, but in that particular thread, I think what's interesting is that often situations like that are chalked up to quote unquote cancel culture. And it's sort of this like, oh, well, you're just not allowed to say if you have a different opinion. But I think there's a huge difference between um, having a different opinion and sort of violent language. And also early on in that thread, many of us were saying, you know, here are some things that, that my black colleagues are saying that you're ignoring. And it would be really great if you would reflect on that. And I think the problem wasn't so much that this person um, had other views. I think a lot of us have had experiences where we've seen somebody come in and say something that maybe we think is not the right way of saying it. And that, and that gets worked out in real time where somebody says, oh, I didn't understand that what I was saying was was thought to be racist. Thank you for helping me. Like that's a pretty simple interaction that I think we're all having a lot now. 
And, and it's different when you have many, many, many black singers saying to you, hey, this is an experience we have. And then you get this pushback of no, these, you know, these are all thugs and I don't care what happens to them. So I think there's a lot more work to do, but it's clearly like a moment in which it's all at the forefront of our minds. And I hope we harness the energy of that to continue to evolve and don't just let it go when it's not in the news anymore. True. It, it has to continue. Absolutely. And I do have, I have heard on the part of uh, many institutions an absolute willingness and desire to change, you know, in a way it was, it was sort of an alert. It was a wake up call. It was a, you know, and I'm not talking about you, your situation specifically, Julia, because that was different. That was obviously that had to be addressed and dealt with. And it was, I think the T Tucker foundation did a very good job and, and I think they will moving forward, do what they said they were going to do. Mm -hmm. um, and invite you uh, into a conversation and make some real change. But, uh, but you know, this has been fantastic for the, for the country in that I do think that there is a tremendous uh, groundswell of support for change. Um, and, but as you said, Ryan, we have to keep it up. You know? um, I want to invite you all to ask questions. All of you singers who are uh, listening, can we take some questions right now? Claire, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, Julia, I really admire how you seem to have cultivated an identity as not only a singer, but in your broader musicianship that is really uniquely crafted to not necessarily being boxed in by any particular style or genre. And I was just wondering, as a person who struggles with, I, I kind of came back to singing a little later, and I enjoy singing a lot of styles, I enjoy songwriting, and I'm trying to kind of find my place or how I move forward, particularly after COVID with feeling like my strengths are maybe within different genres or genre bending. And I wondered if you had any advice moving forward and building a career that is really inclusive of a number of different expressions of your musicianship. Well, I'd love to just have a longer conversation with you about that. And um, I guess just figure out what your real goals are because um having a career in music is uh there are a lot of different ways to do that and what you're studying right now the, the just the the field of music the important i mean this is something i again i have to remind myself of all the time when i'm thinking about or i'm feeling this pressure of like uh, um wanting to do something greater um wanting to do something on a uh quote unquote higher level um i have to always remind myself that the the pursuits the things that i'm after the like the, the fundamentals of the pursuits and that is learning about yourself learning about the world uh asking a lot of questions and just continuing to ask and try to find the answers to them um and the you, you already saying, you know, I had to take a break and then I came back and now I have this whole new like resurgence within myself about what I want to do and how I want to use my voice. That's already the start of, of this journey that you're on. And it does not have to look like anybody else's. Um, it's, I probably will parallel a lot of other people's in, in, in uh, amazing ways. But um, uh, the, the main thing though is I, I, I will have to say just the pursuit of your craft and and understanding your voice and um, respecting your instrument. I think that is so, that is the thing. And when I'm talking about your instrument, it's like, that's your whole person. Um, and checking in, checking in with yourself all the time. Um, Who helps you both with work? Do you have, now I know my, my friends on Broadway have a manager, an agent, a business manager, attorney, and publicist. Do we, do you both just still have a manager? No, I, <laughs> I do have a, a publicist now. Um, it was mostly just because I was doing so much of it on my own for about five years and I just started getting overwhelmed. Um, you know, the question that we've been a manager, you don't need one until you have something to manage. <laughs> That's one thing. And uh, when you have more publicity or more requests than you know how to deal with um, and needing help just strategizing or organizing yourself. Because again, our, this, this study, the, the field that we're in, it's, um, it's not just providing a, a, a product in the immediate moment that we're talking about like long game development and um, a life in music. Uh, 
not just one performance. And, um, but yes, I, I do have, I have a team around me and, and coaches and mentors and uh, network. Yeah. And starting with your relationships with the conductors, with directors um, and being in New York, you know, being already identified as a Juilliard student that you had something very special. Uh, it really helps to kind of give you that push forward because you're all looking to start developing your careers, uh, many of you. Ryan, um, you're very much uh, in, uh, in the opera world. What other engagements have come out of this, all of this work you've done in the uh, pandemic? I think Lyric Opera said that they're working with you now too. I, yeah, it's been really interesting to be, you know, speaking of teams around me, like I, I have started working with a publicist about a year and a half ago too. Um, and it's interesting, you know, I have an opera manager, but now I, it's starting to look like I'm going to need a, somebody to help with the sort of film side of it because, you know, a lot of these things now we're negotiating, we started a production company that does these types of films and we're negotiating directly with a lot, like several different opera companies. We have this by probably six projects that we have coming up in the next four or five months. And often, most of the time, not with me singing, like I'm behind the camera, Tanya and I do it together. Um, so that's, you know, that's been really interesting. And I hope that that's a thing that goes forward. Um, you know, I think there's amazing ways we can mix film and opera, but in terms of the team around, around you, you know, when you're, especially if you're looking at a career that's not just opera or art song and you want to make it, you know, expand it a little bit, I think thinking of who are the people that can help you connect those dots. Cause a lot of the times the sort of standard people that you have will kind of have a standard way of looking at it. More questions from you guys. Uh, I had one. I just wanted to say, because you, you both have such amazing things you're doing, and obviously you've had a lot of experience with this. Like, what do you think when you're generating videos? Like, what what are people looking for? What do you get like engagement out of? And what like platforms do you go for? I'll jump in on that just because I have uh, this is sort of my soapbox, which is that if you are, if your primary motivation is engagement in terms of like clicks and stuff, I think often that, that doesn't, it doesn't work out how you think. I think if you, if you start from a place of like, what's a thing I'd really like to make, what, what is a thing that doesn't exist in the world that I could put in the world? And that could just be with your cell phone at home by yourself. Um, but then, then you are, you're, presenting yourself as an artist. And that often has more traction than just like, oh, I should do an, a vlog because like people like vlogs, you know? Um, I mean, in terms of platforms, like it kind of doesn't matter if, if you're, one thing I will say is that, it, that I'm really bad at this, but if you're consistent about putting out content, that seems to, you know, be a thing about, you know, engagement. But in terms of like, I, would, I wouldn't be putting out digital content with the idea that you're going to become a famous singer from digital content. It's, it's a way to present yourself and to put art out that you care about. And I think we need way more artists doing things with this, these types of platforms that are authentically art and not just like marketing, you know? So, I mean, that's my advice is to lean into that more, but I might be in the minority there. I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't think you, well, sorry. If you are in the minority, you're in it with me. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was just having a recent conversation with a um, uh, uh, recording company and it was the first... Uh, conversation where they said, you know, we're not thinking about this as this uh, an album. There's not, we're, you know, we don't need to think about this as a commodity, something that you need to sell or that needs to sell you. Think of this as a work of art in itself. Um, that was so helpful and illuminating. It was the first time that anyone in regards to recording, uh, at least with a larger, you know, com company, and you know, the recording industry is struggling right now. Um, but wow, how awesome to hear somebody say that, <laughs> you know, like an, an, a, a conversation about art and talking about what are we, what are we wanting to say in this moment? What, how, how will this, this thing that you're wanting to put make and invest your time and energy in, how is this a reflection of you right now? Um, That's amazing. That is a huge shift uh, and a wonderful shift. shift. Yeah, and in some ways, the recording uh, labels have stabilized because Spotify and some of the other streaming sites are providing their income, not individual record sales, because none of us in classical music would ever move the needle in that respect. And so there is more freedom now for the first time for you all to just be artists. 
Um, as long as you can make your living and, you know, get enough work or somehow curate and cultivate enough work to continue doing it, uh, it's, it's really, it gives you some freedom. Um, so do we have one more question? We're just about out of time. Anne? Hello. Um, so given that things are very different now and will be going forward and the fact that you've made this transition that we are currently trying to make from young artists to professional, um, are there any unique opportunities not to seem too opportunistic about it, but it seems like now might be a time for us to be rethinking the specifics of how that leap is going to be made on our part because the world is so different than it was in March. Um, are there any maybe pitfalls or opportunities that thinking back on how you made the transition, it might be different for us going forward? Yeah, I have some thoughts on that. I just, I think the biggest thing is to think of yourself as an entrepreneur right now, because this sort of basic way, the funnel of, you know, you go to a conservatory, you go to a young artist program, you sing small roles, you sing big roles, you win competitions, you have a career, you know, I think that is unlikely to be a, a major way that this happens in the future. And, you know, just, I think thinking of things like what we're just talking about, thinking of things you want to make, talking to artists that you admire. And even if you think those are people like, you know, I, I don't know that I speak for everyone here, but if you have a great idea that you think that I could help you with, you should send me an email. And that's true with like anybody that you're like, this is a great thing for this person, or I would love to do this with this person on any level. I think that kind of thinking where you are, a, you are learning how to be an entire artist and not just a vocational singer. I think that type of singer is going to have a harder time right now. Somebody who's like, here's the great sound that I make. Um, and I still think, I hope there's room for that in the future, but at the moment that, that is, you know, something that you're going to have a hard time with. So just branching out into all these different areas and, and collaborating with people. And when you don't know the answer, find the answer, just ask somebody. That's a great, that's a great response. Don't you also think that um, if we can imagine, if we can think about this in a positive way, the most positive way in terms of your futures, I would say that let's, let's just say that people are miss us very much, that they miss the opportunity to share in a space together an experience that is a live acoustic experience. And the more you can cultivate that with your audience, even if it's only your friends and family, um, the more I think that when we come back, and we will come back, it, we're not sure which opera companies will survive this, but we will come back and new ones will form. And the new ones may be more flexible, may be more digitally oriented as in addition to live performance oriented. You may be, you know, what I would love to see are cabarets around the country that show us of all of these different styles of singing. And, and you, I just want you to be thinking about the opportunities. I'm glad you used that word, Anne, because that is the right word, because there will be tremendous opportunity. People are going to want us back. Um, I'm going to leave you now. We're out of time with Litany, with Julia's beautiful performance of John Musto's Litany. Thank you so much, Ryan and Julia. Big applause from all of us. You are so, so brilliant, and we will follow you. Thank well, you, Renee. Anyway. Thank you.
Oh.